stop using textbooks. Okay, hear me out. I know many of you rely on textbooks and that's part of your, your teaching and your methodology. It's the source of the content that you work from. But I think it's bad for your career to only be using textbooks. Textbooks are notorious for containing information that is, I don't want to say outdated, but can be irrelevant. In many cases, it gives a good guideline. I almost want to say the bare minimum that's needed uh, about the content and maybe some information about assessment. But in a world like we live in today, that's rapidly evolving, rapidly changing, textbooks are not being updated fast enough. Now, in today's episode, I chat to Carrie Ann van Amerbe, who is a teacher who, after 11 years of teaching in a traditional way, decided she wanted to reinvent herself and start using more innovative technologies or pedagogies just to invigorate the engagement for the learners and then making her career fun again. And the story she tells in today's episode just tells me that she's on the right path. The kids in her class, the people at her school are working so well to increase the engagement and fun that learners are having. And in turn, because the teachers are having fun, the kids are having fun. When the kids are having fun, things go better in the classroom and then the teachers are having fun. So I think there's some sage advice on how we can start I almost want to say diversifying your repertoire of resources. We need to use that word, repertoire of resources. Let's see how we can curate information, and put it together to create these innovative learning journeys. I know you're going to enjoy this one. Looking forward to hearing your comments in the social media platform of your choice. Terry, thank you very much for joining us. I'm extremely excited to chat with you today. But for our audience's sake, can you tell us where they can go to stalk you to find out what the amazing things are you're doing in education? Okay, so you can find me on Twitter. And my handle is at TechieTeacherZA, um, the capitals of the ZA. And then on Instagram, it's at TechieTeacherZA, or small caps. And then on TikTok, I just signed up this morning. So that's also all small caps, at TechieTeacherZA. I'm definitely going to go and join you on TikTok, loving the platform. I think I'm spending too much time there. But what I'm seeing is the teachers who are on TikTok are absolutely killing it. Some great content that's there. And knowing the other content that you're, you are producing on the other platforms, I can't wait to see what you'll be doing on TikTok. No pressure, by the way. <laughs> no, totally. It's just something that speaks to my students. Um, a lot of them are on TikTok. So um, I've just thought to gravitate towards learning a new platform. I mean, I'm only 33, I'm a millennial um, and, um, and you know, a techie native. So why not use the platform optimally for the students as well as reaching out to other teachers? So using the holiday to get there. <laughs> that, that's awesome stuff. I will we'll dive into that a little bit later on in today's episode about engagement. Um, and how we can move to the platforms where the kids are. But before we get there, we ask all of our guests to tell us about that teacher in their lives that made an impact. Kerry, who was that teacher or teachers and what did they do to impact your life? Sure. Um, so I think the turning point for me was in grade eight. Now, um, I was one of those kids that slipped through the cracks at school. I had a, sure, I had, I had trouble with bullies, I, I was not academically smart. I had to work very hard for my, my C's and B's. And um, I felt very invisible in, a, in the classroom until I got to grade eight and this history teacher, her name was Anne Seary. And um, she saw me for who I was. She celebrated all my quirks because I was a little bit eccentric, a little bit weird, um, very tomboyish, but and really celebrated who I was as an individual and helped build my self-esteem. And uh, I'll just never forget Anne for what she did for me as a student. And when I became a teacher and she was mentoring me as a history teacher, the things that she taught me there in that space as well. So um, when Anne watches this, I hope she, she gets a pleasant surprise to hear how she actually changed my life. Well, we should, we should definitely send her the link to the episode because um, we've done that before with, our, with previous guests 
and just that recognition that our teachers get and seeing the journeys that we went on and the lives that, they, that they've touched. I mean, we, we proclaim this so many times that teaching is such a great profession because we really impact the future. But this is a, an actual way, a practical way of acknowledging that um, that that amazing influence that these teachers had on our lives. So I'm very grateful for a teacher like the one that you had because she obviously had an influence in creating the techy teacher as she is today. <laughs> very much so, especially having the immense passion that I have towards having an inclusive classroom and where everybody feels welcome and everybody's strengths are celebrated and we are who we are and we're a family so that's one of the driving forces that Anne taught me and the driving forces that drives my classrooms today and we see it so often there's almost you you, you use the term falling through the cracks there's almost more kids falling through the cracks than the ones that are really being paid attention to because as we know we typically pay attention to the kids who like achieve the best in test scores or the naughty ones or the loudest ones but the majority of the children in schooling is that middle, the very chill middle. middle ground. And if they fall through the cracks, I mean, we're not doing our jobs as teachers. 100%. So this is where I get very excited with technology because there's a lot out there that teachers can use to promote inclusivity in the classroom, to empower their students, to to really genuinely have an engaged learning community. And that's what tech has offered us. And that is what has led me to really question even how we assess. I mean, let alone what we've been through in this, this pandemic classroom. So I have really fallen in love with project-based learning because, you know, it's, it really does celebrate everybody's ability and it meaningfully demonstrates what they understand and scaffolds learning to extend them further. So, yeah, it, it's just mind blowing what tech can offer us in, in this generation and this, this current trend. And I just wish for more teachers to explore for the so, betterment of their students, really. You know, we'll, we'll then, I'm also parking that one. We'll definitely talk about project based <laughs> learning. <laughs> with technology because I do think that the, the, that uh, every one of them assists in driving the, the diversity and the inclusion in the classroom further. So we'll, we'll, we'll delve into that aspect on how teachers can actually use project-based learning and we'll use some examples from what you're doing in your practice just to stimulate some ideas and see what it is that the rest of us can do in our classrooms. But Gary, if you were to like identify the traits of a super teacher, like somebody that really makes them, this is a teacher that stands out from the rest. What would you say is that characteristic? Hmm, if I had to pick top three. All right, I'm good with three. Top three, flexibility. Mm -hmm. Nothing goes according to plan 100% of the time. It doesn't. So being able to be flexible, to adapt your teaching style, to adapt your approach, to even, yeah, just being flexible, especially in your approach, because not every student is the same. Not every learning situation is the same. So if I see something's not working, hit the brakes, reverse, and go down the other, the other avenue, because flexibility is key, and this is where the most organic and the most beautiful learning opportunities can happen tech assisted or not. So definitely flexibility. Good. Um, hold, number on, two. hold on, hold on. I want to ask you a question about that. We'll, we'll delve into the other two as well. Um, <laughs> you, you've mentioned in our chats that for 11 years in your teaching career, you were quite traditional. And then you made a move and said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to uh, adapt my, my practice. And I've got so many colleagues who I am coaching at the moment who are going through exactly the same. Like they feel like I want to teach differently. Like we've noticed that the traditional way that we've always been teaching isn't really as, as effective. So that was you. What, tell us a bit more about your journey from, from the traditional teacher to techie teacher. So um, I've always been passionate about education. I've always been passionate about relationship with students and being a team and really 
getting them from not knowing to, to knowing. And um, when I, yo, it's a very long story, but in a nutshell, in January 2018, I started working at Stain City School and we were going through the process of becoming a Microsoft Showcase School. Now, from having no tech skills other than a smart board in a tiny little classroom at my previous school and a laptop, I dove into this rabbit hole. I can only really explain it as Alice in Wonderland effect. You know, you dive into this rabbit hole and then my eyes were opened by um, just the resources we had at, at our disposal. Um, and even just the Microsoft professional development that the school's offering us with, through Microsoft. And this rabbit hole opened my eyes and just transformed me into the person that I am today. And my absolute drive, driving force behind my pedagogical approaches is 21st century learning design. I just, that really is my groove. So that is how I got there. And I just progressed and I started with one or two things and then three and four started. And then I've got a whole treasure trove of tools in my pedagogical toolkit that I use on a daily basis that allows me to be flexible and inclusive at the same time. It's very exciting. So Gary, if I understand it correctly, the school initiated some professional development because they made a strategic um, um, shift saying that we're going to be using Microsoft in education and having more technology in the school. And after you've been exposed to the schools based professional development, you realize that there's so much more, there's value to what um, I'm seeing. So let me explore and see what else I can use in the classroom. Exactly. So I work with a lot of like-minded individuals that are also very uh, passionate about how we can make learning better for the students and different. So from there, I use that as a springboard as well as my colleagues that were, we were encouraging each other. Mm. And I branched out. I branched out to Flipgrid Live professional learning networks. I branched out to Wakelet professional learning networks. And it just snowballed from there and fueled my passion even more to really understanding how students, how the children of today are wired, number one. And number two, seeing how this tech can really assist in um, me having an inclusive classroom. And it made me really excited. Further to that, it's just been amazing to meet different teachers online. And social media has been a powerful tool to help me network and find people to call my tribe. You know, I have this crazy idea. I reach out to you. I'm like, you know, Francho, what do you think about this? Or if I reach out to the Flipgrid team or the Wakelet team, you know, it's, it's really cool that social media has also played a role in finding inspiration, finding support and having people to really bounce ideas off of. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's been a real cool experience the past three years. And I'm really enjoying the space that I'm in. And I'm really enjoying the space that my classroom is in. I, I really have the most fantastic work colleagues, the most fantastic students, and together we are better. And it's, it's really, really cool how professional development has really opened my eyes as I've gone through this rabbit hole into Wonderland, really and honestly. So that's, that, that's what I think is, is, is so great about your story, is acknowledging that I, even, I, even though I'm a good teacher and I know a lot about my, my practice, there's always room for improvement. And joining yeah. these professional learning networks is so, so critical. And that's why I started my mastermind of other like-minded teachers to come and join and we chat once a month to improve each other's practice. So I think you're spot on in saying that flexibility, but you can't be flexible if you don't. Um, if you don't have the tools or you don't know what is exactly. available and you learn that exactly. through your professional learning networks. So, Kerry, that was the first one was flexibility. You said there were two other traits of a super teacher. Let's go with the other one. A sense of humor. Mm -hmm. I say sense of humor, especially in the light of COVID, right? Oh, because one minute we're at school, one minute we're, we're at home. And, you know, sense of humor is important because, you know, you can't take life so seriously. You've got to see life and learning with childlike wonder. Otherwise, the magic in learning is gone. 
So by having a sense of humor and finding the light side of things as well, it's, it's vitally important. It's another way to connect with your students as well. It's, it's good for them to see that you're human, that you're vulnerable. And that's a way to, to establish a, a genuinely caring and trusting relationship. So a sense of humor, definitely. So I, I think you're spot on, but a lot of people think that when you say you've got a sense of humor, you have to be funny and you need to be this class clown. But I don't think that's what having a sense of no. humor is about. No, not at all. You know, because you might have this brilliant lesson plan and you think that it's going to land well with the kids. And it doesn't. You've got to have a sense of humor in terms of, you know, laugh it off, get up, brush yourself off, and just understand that, okay, that lesson didn't land well. Let me analyze where I can be better, or perhaps even ask the students what could have uh, been presented differently or done better, and go back to the drawing board, rehash it out, and try again. Because you can't take it so seriously, because life in itself doesn't go according to the script all the time, right? Yeah, ab absolutely. And then not taking yourself so seriously, as you said, brings back the fun, brings back the magic. And isn't that what we're all looking for? Like teaching can be such a very really like down and like very depressing profession if you allow it to be. But once you have yeah. the sense of humor, you don't take yourself so seriously. You can take learning seriously, but you don't need to take yourself mm -hmm. so serious. Yes, exactly. And I, I really do feel that students do enjoy seeing the vulnerable side of the teacher because it does make for a real, genuinely trusting, loving relationship that really forms, that looks like teamwork instead of, I am the boss, I am the teacher, and you are the student. You know, like, know your, like the old traditional way of know your line, stay behind it, and don't question because that also stops learning from happening. And you don't allow them to question. Exactly. There's interesting studies coming from America at the moment, uh, one released in 2020, actually showing that schools who focus mainly on um, uh, um, marks or on, on grades versus schools who focus on social emotional learning, relationships, values mm -hmm. for kids are showing that the, the schools that are focusing on the values and the relationship with learners are proving to be greater indicators for graduation success than people who focus on, on marks and assessment. So once the research starts showing that building that relationship, being human, caring, almost the softer elements of teaching is actually the things that help our kids progress in life and graduate from school. I, yeah, I can believe that. I've seen it in my classroom where I've had students come in that don't think much of themselves, that feel like, you know, I'm not my best. I'm not as clever as X, Y, and Z, you know? And then once they, they can see themselves through, the, through your eyes, how you see them, their marks pick up, they're a lot happier, they're, they're more engaging with their peers, not only with other teachers, and they just, their mental well-being just, you know, is on a different level, and they're just much happier. Happy kids learn. That's what my boss says. Happy now, kids oh, learn. Well, I, I, absolutely, I absolutely like that saying. So let's move on to the third trait of a super teacher, according to you. Hmm. You have to be organized. Organization is key. I'm not saying that the cleanest desk is the most organized teacher, because my desk is definitely not neat and clean. I mean, look at Albert Einstein's desk, right? He was this amazing scientific mind. But when you look at that iconic photograph that was taken of his desk the day that he passed away, his desk was chaos. So I'm not saying organization is key. It's just being able to organize what you want to learn. So as you lesson planning, you need to be organized in a sense, you need to know your outcomes, where you would like to go, and activities that are linked to those outcomes that can meaningfully scaffold learning to keep your students engaged so that they get the, the optimum amount of skills and learning out of that lesson. So you need to have a plan, be organized, and yep. um, focus on the students and their needs because they are number one. That's why we're here. So I'm currently training about 60 different intern teachers. And I thought that in the training we'll be doing, the coaching that we'll be doing with them, I'm going to get a lot of questions about pedagogy and methods and how, like, how to teach. And at the end of the day, what they're asking me is, 
How do I cope with all of the admin? How do I, how do I arrange my day? How can I become more productive? And um, what I started doing with them is created an online course just on teachers and productivity. Like, how do you make sure that you've got a, a good morning routine, a night routine, balancing family responsibilities with your work yeah. responsibilities? It's, it's, it's can get overwhelming and lead to mental distress or to um, a, a lesser mental health, which then affects the classroom again. So if we don't have these things in place, if we don't know how to cope with chaos, then that chaos spills into our classrooms. For sure. And that's why I said organization to an extent, right? And having a sense of humor, because it's very important. So what I can tell you was that I used to get bogged down in marking, right? I have been running an exclusively electronic classroom since January 2019. I have a textbook, but it's not what I follow 24-7. At the end of the day, learning happens unexpectedly, where the, stu the students might bring up something, for instance, about two weeks ago, we were learning about nuclear energy. And I said to them, there's, a pro and, there's pros and cons for everything. And not, the textbook had nothing about the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. The textbook had nothing about the 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster. So that day, I put my, my content aside, because I do everything electronically, and off we went on break. We did breakout rooms in Microsoft Teams because we were remote learning at that time. And half the class went and did some research on Chernobyl and did a little um, feedback to us as a class orally on what they found out about nuclear on that side. And then the rest of the class gave me a report back on the 2011 Fukushima disaster. So it is very important in the sense that I've used technology to really streamline my activities um, also head us off into directions that the textbook doesn't cover. But I'll be honest with you, my Microsoft Outlook calendar is my best friend. I've loaded my timetable on there. I've also, as you said, balancing home life with mental wellness time for myself. I've also used my Outlook calendar to schedule my gym classes. You know, so that's mommy's time to go and just be carry on for, for, for 90 minutes or so, you know, so that, that's my release. I'll go to gym a couple of times a week. Um, I've also got my children's schedule on there. So I know that um, if my elders need to go to ballet, it's just, if you can organize your time with technology, it does help. You, maybe if you don't like technology, use a diary, just make sure that you diarize time for yourself and that gives me a sense of I have control over some things so the chaos doesn't spill over and upset me, as you say. Yep. But my electronic classroom and my electronic lifestyle of keeping everything, all my ducks in a row and not at a rave has been very helpful. So that's, that's definitely helpful. I, I agree. I mean, I, I, I can't function really without my, my calendar because Everything about my life is on there. I use time blocking as a product, productivity management tool just yes. to make sure that I get to everything that I need, need to get to. And I think when, when teachers use these kind of productivity tools, whether it's online, the digital, or whether it's analog, you have a, a diary or a to-do list. I mean, things like that is absolutely cool. And we need to encourage people to use more of that. But Kerry, thank you so much for sharing those three traits of a super teacher. Now, um, we've started a recruitment company called goteach.co.za. I'm adding those three things to the list that I'm looking for, for teachers. Um, and if schools want to find teachers to come and work at their schools, they're more than welcome. <laughs> to go to goteach.co.za to go and find those flexible teachers who have a sense of humor and can organize their day. I think if you've got those three things, many principals will be happy to appoint somebody like that. For sure. Kerry, you mentioned something now, and we, we had a discussion about this, and I want this almost to be the, the, the remainder of our discussion is this thing about textbooks. Um, now, <laughs> We're going to title this like it's clickbaity title. We're going to go stop using textbooks. That's going to be the title of this episode. Of course, we don't mean like throw away your textbook. Literally, yeah. There's a there, there there is this this idea that the textbook is everything. There are teachers who are like glued to their textbook because let's face it, it's efficient. If you cover the content that's in the textbook, it makes you like cover the 
minimum of the curriculum. And I think there are teachers who rely on the textbook to do that. But is that really conducive to our learners? Is it conducive to learning in general? But then also mm -hmm. our, our super teachers do more than just what's in the textbook. And you are such exactly. a great example of this. Um, tell us, what is, what, is your, what is your thoughts around textbooks and what can we do to not only use our textbook? Sure. Lots going on there and I've got lots running through my mind because it is something I'm, I'm very, I get very excited about when I talk to people about this. So being one of those students that slipped through the cracks, although I loved reading, my textbooks were boring. It, it's, it's unfortunate, but with the age of technology, it has given rise to children being used to instant gratification, right? Social media, phone, click, and everything reacts. Why don't we use that to our best advantage, right? And so this is where I thought. I, I might like how, how renewable energy is covered in this textbook, but I prefer how the other textbook prefers circuit uh, explains circuit diagrams. So why not look at a number of textbooks or a number of digital resources and compile them into one space? You know how your children like to learn. Because I mean, as we, it's it's a relationship where you with your students all of, all of the time, most of the time. So you know what what speaks to them, um, what would interest them. So like I mentioned with the nuclear disasters, I knew that I had four kids in my class that were very into um, those disaster shows and that uh, abandoned engineering on Discovery Channel. So this is what I really feel passionate about in terms of. You need to bring learning to them. If it can be done digitally, because it brings learning to life through the use of YouTube videos or animated uh, presentations, or even bringing your little Bitmoji in. I love using Bitmoji. Bring it in to one place. So um, the, the word that I like to use, because it's the, the word of the pandemic classroom is app smashing. I create my content, whether it's in PowerPoint or in Genially Online. I share it as an interactive slideshow and I app smash it into Wakelet. And I compose, uh, I create these interactive learning units that obviously benchmark and I still follow the curriculum for the outcomes, the IB outcomes that need to be covered. But it's done so in a way that brings learning alive. There's no way that the children can get disengaged with clicking here, clicking there, because that's another argument some people have said to me, Bob, but if you learn online, you can get distracted by the other online noise. This is why I use Wakelet and App Smash everything in it, because it brings the focus into one area. They don't, the students don't get lost online or distracted elsewhere. And the beauty of not using that textbook, although it's a great textbook, is that I can send us off into learning in a different direction. It's a very organic process where a lot of the time the students are asking me, I heard about this. Do you mind if we, we take some time of the lesson and explore that? And of course I oblige and off we go. So by not using the textbook, it, it just allows for the natural organic learning uh, process where you and the kids can go off and learn something together. I mean, I don't know everything. And I often say to the kids, I don't know, but let's find out together. And that's what, that's what really takes us off into to that direction. So that's why I, I really do feel that textbooks are great, but we need to present lesson content in such a way that keeps our students engaged. And if we have to use technology, if not, why not? It's there. Let's utilize it because the younger generation speak tech. It is just how it is. And that's how I celebrate what they enjoy and I use it to my advantage. And I have fun along the way too. I find it very therapeutic, app smashing and making everything that's mine because it's it's a way for me to make sure that I understand the content and then make sure that I'm presenting it in such a way that's that's you know accurate, but also will land with my kids. 
And I think this is the art of teaching. And I think a lot of a lot of teachers get into the profession and it's just like cookie cutter, copy and paste one lesson into the next. But what this allows us to be is to become these curators of content, curators yes. of learning. Because what Wakelet yes. then allows you to do is your textbook is one of the resources to your disposal. Mm -hmm. You as the teacher can now go, okay, I want to teach the specific concept. I've got X, Y, and Z resources. Let me pull in these resources into a worksheet, and I'm using that in inverted commas, that the kids can follow. It's part of the learning journey that you've developed for them, that you've designed for them. And I think this is what teachers, uh, or, or I'd say the mediocre teachers lack, is this willingness to design a learning journey for every class or every, every concept. And as you rightfully said, you know the relevance of it to your kids. If they don't know the relevance, how useful the information is to them. If we, the example you used is spot on with a nuclear disaster, speaking about Chernobyl, I mean, I, uh, my history sucks, but I think it was in the 60s, if I'm correct. Kirian. 1986. <laughs> 80s. Oh, it was in the 80s. You know, that's how bad I am with history. Um, I was two years <laughs> old, so I didn't care. It wasn't useful for me then. But the point mm. being that our textbooks should be including that if, if it was in the 80s. But now, as you said, the Fukushima disaster and things like that, you could bring that in because textbooks mm -hmm. are old. Even by the time a textbook gets published, the information yeah. in it is old. Exactly. And that's my, that's my argument I have against academic journals. That's the arguments I have against most books. That's the argument I have against most textbooks is that it's not the most up-to-date information. It doesn't take away the relevance of the information that is there. We need to acknowledge that but it doesn't contain the most updated versions or with the, the, with the latest discoveries. And that's why if you've got the internet at your disposal and you know how to look for these resources, you can now bring that into the classroom. And when the kids feel that they're not learning about 1980s, they're learning about 2015s, then they go like, ah, okay, this is now relevant to my life. But you know, it's also very interesting about using wakelets and... Um just tech to curate your learning activities and lesson content is that it also I know with Microsoft 365 there's an accessibility checker so you can make sure that no one is um, that it's, it's able to be translated if it needs to be translated by students I had a student that came to us from the Congo so we used a lot of that translating for French to English so he could actually understand and he did he's doing very well now but also for someone that might have visual impairments. So definitely using that has been amazing. It's very helpful, but also with that, like I said, accessibility tools. Wakelet has an immersive reader. So my dyslexic children that might want to revisit a lesson and they, you know, dyslexic, it's like the letters jump all the time. It can be read to them. I do, um, open book pop quizzes, I call them pop quizzes, um, just to test their learning. It's never a formative assessment. And again, my dyslexic students can use the immersive reader. They just, they know how to use it. It's been normalized in my classroom as well. They click on it, they put in the earphones and it's read to them. And that has, it, it really has been an immense game changer for education because these students that used to need a scribe and a reader can now take meaningful real ownership of their learning through the use of these assist, uh, assistive tech tools. So digital curation is actually quite powerful. It's empowering the students that need those tools. So that's also something that people need to remember instead of shying away from the tech is that it's empowering the students in more ways than one, not only with the knowledge. Now, the great thing is you can almost have these user-created textbooks where the kids can create a specific textbook for their own learning. Even if they do it collaboratively in class, um, um, they curate different uh, resources and they then put it all together in a source. And then they've got some ownership over their learning. They feel like this wasn't being preached at me. It's I've co-created the resource and therefore I co-created the learning. For sure. And we have done that. I have done that personally with my students with uh, Microsoft OneNote. We've got a class notebook where we all collaborate in. 
We have collaborated on Wakelet collections as well. Our virtual science fair this year is going to be curated in Wakelet as well. We're very excited to have you join us, Dr. Francois. The children have been very busy making the invitations to you. But as you say, if they feel like they've had a say in what they want to learn, that they've added meaning to the learning, it really gets them excited and have meaningful student engagement and nobody gets left behind. It's so hard to get left behind when everybody's excited together. I love it. That, that, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. I am definitely there. I can't, <laughs> I can't wait to see all of this in action because I believe that you really are, uh, I almost want to say the poster child in South Africa for these <laughs> kind of engagements. Um, the, everything I've seen from you on social media just shows me I would have loved to be a child in your classroom. Now, oh, okay. speak, speak about... The, the, the science fair, because I know there's another element to, to the science fair and how you guys are going to showcase it. I've got some inside info, um, but what you are willing to share, I would love to hear, like, how are you structuring this, this science fair? Because I think with, with COVID-19, the lockdowns, people are really, really reluctant to gather in large groups. We, we know um, the, the previous science fairs, how, what the excitement and the buzz is in a hall when a lot of people come and see the, exp uh, the, 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 the exhibits. Now, recreating that feeling, recreating that learning online is not as simple, but you've got a way of doing it. So I can't take all credit for it. I can't take all the credit for it. I work with the most amazing teachers at State City. So I'm just one of the few tech teachers that teaches science. It was actually our director of technology and innovation, Chanel Viviers, who said, all right, why don't we host host the science fair in Minecraft? And it's, it's, it's such a beautiful story. So we started building, we had grade threes to grade sevens back in 2018, building our school to scale in Minecraft, to scale. Even little nine-year-olds are reading building plans to build it to scale in Minecraft. And then um, in 2019, the architect was most kind and gave us a copy of the college, the college campus's blueprint. And then we challenged the construction team to a board off who could finish building first. And it was so cool to see the buy-in from all the students now using, you know, geography skills, map skills, uh, scale and, and um, maths and even our little nine-year-olds i mean we, we we got into it we built the school by the october to scale the whole college onto our camp uh, virtual campus so with that having that build and having that beautiful file on on hand and chenille saying let's have the science fair virtually in minecraft at school so that's what he did and with the help of our edtech brenton at the time he he set up the science fair on the field and each little, um, it's called an NPC, a non-player character. And we each, we had each little NPC um, set up and named after each kid that was presenting at the science fair. So you could walk through the science fair, click on the NPC and it says, hi, I'm Emma. And we learned and we uh, researched, uh, meant and they did, mental wellness in South Africa during the time of COVID-19. These are 11 year olds, hey? And I let them do it, it was amazing. I'll, I'll share some student work if you want to put links in and let people have a look. Absolutely. And you click on the link and it takes you through to the Wakelet collection and Wakelet really lent itself beautifully to it because it was a multimedia presentation. They could app smash anything they wanted in there. And the amount of learning and 21st century skill sets that the students acquired during this time was amazing. And the organic energy of us collaborating together, um, myself and the teams, the different teams, was the most organic, the most exciting, the most meaningful learning experience for them. And it was so beautiful as a teacher to see because at the end, uh, when it was presented to parents, I found myself tearing up, listening to feedback from parents when they said, I didn't think my child could do something like this. Or my child really took, can't believe my child took an interest in mental wellness and did a deep dive into that because it's such a mature topic. 
And I think what's also very important here, even though people sometimes get discouraged about the idea of project-based learning and that oh, it's a lot of effort, you know, it's a lot of time. But you know what? If you don't give your students the opportunity to learn, to grow through these experiences, you as the teacher, you'll never know the truest potential that's what they can create, what they can do. But it's also beautiful in a sense to show the children what they are truly capable of. And I really think that is something so important and needed in this time, especially in these days. Yeah, no, that's, that's so valuable and so different from the traditional classroom. And I think kids can get easily bored and be like, why do I need to go to school? I promise you if I, if I was in a school that um, had a project like this, on Minecraft, uh, the, the gamer in me would just go like, oh, this is like the integration of two different worlds that I'm interested amazing. in. That the engagement that you get from that is amazing. For sure. I mean, I, I use mine, Minecraft lends itself to English. Minecraft lends itself to maths. Minecraft Education Edition has a lot on its platform for free for teachers to use in their lessons as lesson enhancements or an extension to lessons. And the more I got, I got used to Minecraft, the more I could actually create my own lessons in Minecraft. I was featured on Purple ZA's um, site recently about one of my lessons I did in term one about habitats and biomes and having the children build them in Minecraft, research it, and then they filmed walkthrough videos and uploaded it onto Flipgrid so that we could all see each other's work and give peer assessments. Minecraft and Flipgrid, I mean, they're both powerful tools, but Minecraft is so underrated by some teachers, I reckon. Uh, well, that's my personal opinion. It's just such a simple yet powerful tool to really enhance learning. So, so why not dive into it? If, you, if your school has a subscription, go and do some investigating. See how magic Minecraft is. Because gamification is learning in playful form. Because play is learning. I mean... We think about child development. What do they do at preschool? They play. Play is learning. So it's the same thing with 11 year olds in Minecraft. Come on, let's use it. Let's have fun. Okay, I'm a new teacher. Imagine I'm like student teacher. I am uh, an intern teacher at a school. All of this is quite overwhelming because now I'm hearing, I'm hearing Wakelet, um, Minecraft, Flipgrid, um, uh, Microsoft, all of these different apps. And, and like, it's easy to become like overwhelmed by, by all of this. If you were to give advice to a student teacher or an intern teacher, or maybe a novice teacher just starting off, where would you say should they start on this journey? So I was very overwhelmed at first until I got into it. So my number one would be, Number one, you need to get yourself into a professional learning community, whether it is Facebook group or a flip. Yeah, so yeah, I was on a Flipgrid group and a Wakelet group. So find a professional learning group online to start your deep dive. Unless you are a Google school or a Microsoft school, they have professional development on tap online for you. So definitely start where there is professional development then. Once you become accustomed to knowing what's out there, number two, pick your top two and get used to it for a while. So I started with Flipgrid. I then went on to Minecraft. I got comfortable there. I then discovered Wakelet. I got comfortable there and then I branched out to everything. Now I'm sitting with five or six different tools that I use. And with that being said, my students are also quite comfortable to jump between platforms. But for, for, for the newies, start with two and branch out, only when you're comfortable. And number three, view learning with childlike wonder. Because when you are not excited about how something is done or presented, find something that brings the excitement back because learning is magic, it really is. And for me, my top six really do keep things magical in the classroom. If I could have, oh my goodness, it's just, if I, if, if I had to just say those are my top three rules, those are the top three rules, because they say you don't, you stop listening after 30. It seems like magic is 
the magic number is three. So those are the top three. But definitely don't lose, don't lose that sense of wonder about things. Because as teachers, we are lifelong learners. And if you get tired of learning, then teaching is not for you, unfortunately. I like that, Gary. Thank you very much. I think this is a good place to end it. If people want to get hold of you because um, they've now listened to you, they've found the value, just once again, where do people go if they want to reach out to you? All right. So Twitter, it's at Techie Teacher. Uh, Techie is with an I-E. Techie Teacher Z-A. And Instagram also, Techie Teacher Z-A, or lower caps. And then TikTok. You can try and find me. I haven't done anything just yet. Hopefully by next week, I've got a few videos up, but that's also Techie Teacher ZA. Um, what I can do also then, Francois, is give you a link to um, a Wakelet's example of how I've done, um, present, you know, presented Science Fest and uh, curated a few learning activities for the students in Wakelet. Um, and then I'm also very open to teachers reaching out to me online just to bridge and wag, have... Um, share ideas with me, bounce an idea off of me. Um, how would I present this? I'm very open to collaboration because I'm so passionate about 21st century learning design and instilling those vital skill sets in the students because at the end of the day, their, their future's ahead. Some of their jobs haven't been created as yet because of technology. So we need to make sure that our students are future ready. Excellent. Thank you very much. And thank you for that invitation. I'm sure that many of our teacher friends will be reaching out to you. I know I definitely will. And I can't wait to uh, meet up with you guys in the future to uh, see what you get up to. Um, on the note of joining a professional learning network, for those of you listening who want to become part of the mastermind, we meet once a month to chat about your challenges in education, see how we can make learning fun and make your job fun again and see what your victory conditions could be to improve your profession. So please come. If you're listening to this and you want to find out more about the mastermind, you can just hit me up, um, either send me a DM or comment somewhere. But if you want to reach me on email, you can just go hi, hi at phoenixed.co.za. But Kerry, thank you very much for your time. Have a great, great holiday. And then when you get back, keep on inspiring. <laughs>